Shepard. Grunt. Shepard. Rex. Commander Shepard. Shepard, Shepard, Shepard. Rex. Grunt. Shepard. 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 Grunt. Shepard. Rex. Commander Shepard. Shepard, Shepard, Shepard. Rex. Grunt. Shepard. 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 Hello there. We continue ranking all Mass Effect games with my Stasocritic scoring system. Details are in the pinned comment. Even though Mass Effect 2 didn't help at all with progressing the plot of the trilogy, that didn't stop it from becoming a really great game. As a result, Mass Effect 3 was incredibly hyped up. In the end, many felt the game, and more specifically the ending, didn't quite live up to that hype. The whole situation surrounding the ending is a complex topic that's beyond the scope of this video, we're going to focus only on what's in the game proper, so, without further ado, let's begin. I admire Mass Effect 3. The sheer scope of it is mesmerizing, and yet half of it, if not more, is going to be invisible to most players. It's a predicament of every title that's focused on player agency influencing the narrative. A good chunk of content is not going to be seen without replaying the game. But the majority is fine with only a single playthrough, yet all that choice-dependent content still has to be created. Dialogue writing, voice acting, animation, sound effects, programming and scripting to put it all together, testing, bug fixing, the whole development pipeline for, at best, with the most binary choice possible, 50% of the audience. But not only that, it's important to recognize a player's past choices, which again means unique content that needs to have more variations the longer the preceding chain of actions is. And since Mass Effect promised an interconnected narrative across a trilogy of games, Mass Effect 3 needs not only to recognize choices made within itself, but also across past two games. And it all has to feel as natural as possible. So, for example, one player might see this. These females are the best, and probably last hope for my people. We'll bring them back, Rex. Don't worry. I appreciate that, Liara. I wouldn't want anyone else along for the ride. <coughs> I suppose I can make room for you too, Garrus. <laughs> Figured you'd gone soft sitting on your throne. Forgot how to hold a gun. Another player might not have taken Liara to that mission, in which case this particular interaction with Garrus wouldn't really make sense, so... These females are the best, and probably last hope for my people. We'll bring them home, Rex. You've waited long enough for this day. A lifetime. I appreciate the assist, Garrus. Figured you'd gone soft sitting on your throne, forgot how to hold a gun. Maybe a player doesn't have Garrus on the team, and they took someone else, like Edie? These females are the best, and probably last hope for my people. Retrieving them should be a simple matter. Who's the synthetic? I'm Edie, the Normandy's artificial intelligence. Sounds like Joker didn't teach you anything about Solarians. Or let's say Javik. These females are the best, and probably last hope for my people. Then we'll slaughter the Salarians if they get in our way. Who's that? He's a Prothean. Sometimes I'm not sure if the Normandy's a warship or a traveling freak show. But as long as he can hold a gun. That is, if we don't mention that Rex might have died all the way back in Mass Effect 1, in which case we would have a conversation with an entirely different Krogan leader. There are so many other examples, both big and small, in main and side content. Yes, some solutions resort to automatic stock camera placements and animations, because you can't possibly do everything at the same cinematic level of quality. And there's a lot of dialogue that just happens during gameplay without any interaction, as a cheaper but still effective way to squeeze out more character depth. 
but some of the bigger side quests tackle all the variables with an effort equal to that of a main mission. And it's not just dialogue either. For example, there is a side quest involving Kasumi Goto, obviously created with the intent to respect the choices of players who have recruited her in the second game and managed to keep alive during the suicide mission. However, in case that didn't happen, not only are there different dialogues, but also a whole additional choice added at the end, which could influence the fate of the Hanar homeworld. So even this pretty small side quest has three different outcomes depending on choices from Mass Effect 2. I am absolutely amazed by just how much the team has managed to do in a span of two years. Most likely with an ungodly amount of crunch, that's just such a small cycle for this kind of game. With that in mind, it's understandable why there is some lack of polish across the board. For example, so many scenes have sound effects fully or partially missing. Cease and desist all aggression. It's over. And as polished as the visuals try to be, very often you will encounter weird, sometimes even creepy stuff. For all intents and purposes, this game should have been called Mass Effect Concessions, because to make everything work, it's full of them. No thanks to Mass Effect 2 doing its own separate thing in the corner. As a result, not only Mass Effect 3 has to take into account a metric ton of incoming variables, it also has to do that while handling its own main plotline of fighting the Reapers, handling what should have been Mass Effect 2's main plotline of finding out how to defeat the Reapers, resolving all the matters that Mass Effect 2 introduced and left wide open, like the increased importance of Cerberus and the elusive man's motivations, the impact of the Collector's base choice, the rift between Shepard and some of their former allies from Mass Effect 1, and that's just to name a few. To make it all work, Mass Effect 3 minimizes the amount of new variables created while pushing all the plots and subplots forward, which means decreasing the amount of dialogue choice options in a lot of conversations, with many of the existing choices being just Paragon or Renegade reactions that lead to the same result. As a side note, Mass Effect 3 has finally solved the Paragon Renegade conundrum by having both moralities add points to a single reputation meter, which defines the possibility to use charm and intimidate options. Even though now the Paragon Renegade monikers become nothing more than a legacy appendix, this great land shackles your role playing options as binary as some of these options may be. The irony of it all is that some of Mass Effect 3's strongest, most compelling and emotionally charged moments revolve around subplots that Mass Effect 2 didn't forget about, in particular the resolutions of the Krogan Genophage and the Quarian Geth conflict. To be absolutely fair, the streamlining of Mass Effect 3's dialogue interactions has a side effect of making some outcomes in these very complex questions feel more favorable or morally superior. But at least there is still enough material to support alternative resolutions and make them feel valid too. But more importantly, everything that happens on Surkesh, Tachanka, the Gatha Dreadnought and Ranak is proof that such a crazy ambitious concept like Mass Effect can work. A singular player-influenced narrative developed in eight years across three different games where the first title sets up a problem, the second pushes it further while taking previous choices into account, and the third takes all these tons of variables that include who lived, who died, who you never even met, who is loyal, who is not, who you punch in the face or something, while providing a set of different outcomes that depends on what choices you have done across all three games and tying it all together into progressing the main narrative thread. Which is why it can feel very painful that significant chunks of Mass Effect 3 are quite blunt and inelegant. Maybe not necessarily by choice, but that doesn't change the situation. The second game placed the Reapers on the sidelines, but the third one can't really work without them attacking. So in the though in both Mass Effect 1 and Mass Effect 2 Arrival DLC we have prevented potential surprise attacks, somehow the Reapers surprise attacked anyway. The third game also can't work without a way to defeat the Reapers. 
Suddenly, Liara mostly forgets about her new Shadow Broker profession from Mass Effect 2, with only some mandatory mentions that it happened, so she could go back to her archaeological interests and find plans on Mars archives of what seems to be a Prothean device intended to defeat the Reapers. Not foreshadowed in previous games, but it can be used as a catalyst to unite all races in building it. Some aspects from Mass Effect 2 are just seemingly ignored. Mass Effect 3 doesn't even try to paint Cerberus as a complex entity anymore, they're just plain out evil and indoctrinated, to eradicate the ambiguity of motivations and streamline storytelling. So Cerberus wanted to go into politics, huh? Nice job shutting those assholes down. Didn't you used to work for those assholes? Something about leather seats. I worked for Cerberus when they were vigilantes helping the helpless. Now they're a little too mainstream. And evil. In general, it feels like some dialogues were written specifically to troll Mass Effect 2. So the Geth believed your proof that the Reapers were coming back? Of course. That must have been nice. And look, it wouldn't be fair of me to say that all poor parts of Mass Effect 3 are somehow caused by Mass Effect 2. The game has some pretty bad stuff of its own creation, like this guy, for example. <sighs> so self-indulgent and incompetent, yet during cutscenes gains plot armor and infects other characters with his stupidity. Let's... let's ignore Kailang. With the amount of threads that have to be resolved and time limits put on the project, it's not surprising that some of it will be bad, nonsensical, or simply absent. Until the Leviathan DLC, there has been practically nothing in the base game that would reveal additional information behind the history of the Reapers. And while I won't cover DLCs separately like with other games for the same reasons, each is only a couple hours of content that's well integrated into the main campaign, Mass Effect 3 is probably the one game in the series which doesn't feel complete without its DLCs. At the same time, even such an important and intriguing inclusion like the Leviathan, at the end of the day just transforms into a war asset number. Every main and side quest does, as well as various objects you can scan for on planets instead of resources. By the way, the map navigation and scanning gameplay is still boring, and the Reaper chases on the map don't make it more exciting, even though I suppose it does work in terms of showing how exploration isn't safe anymore, but at least you don't have to spend as much time in these modes as you had in Mass Effect 2. Your total number of war assets is going to be multiplied by the galactic readiness percentage, and that second number depends entirely on the multiplayer part of the game. On one hand, this is an interesting way to tie up two modes together, but the previous games were purely single-player. It's not fair for a new multiplayer mode to play an important role in defining the end of the single-player experience. But I do get why a co-op mode was added, as quite frankly, Mass Effect 3 is a great third-person action game with RPG mechanics. First, shooting and movement feels amazing, and there's such a huge variety of weapons, not only in terms of their types of damage or firing modes, but also aspects more closely related to core gameplay, like how their recoil is handled and what type of button presses the guns require. Then, Mass Effect 3 found a fantastic compromise between the first game's RPG depth and the second one's streamlining. Half of each skill tree actually requires you to choose between different parameters and bonus effects, and then the recharge time of these abilities depends on how heavy is your weapon loadout. This is a very elegant solution that allows you to tune characters towards preferred playstyle without making the whole system too overwhelming for more action-oriented players. And finally, the enemy design actually varies in many more aspects than just barrier types. There are several factions, and each archetype in them differs in style and behavior. So firefights in this game feel very fun, and participating in more of them through multiplayer is appealing. Most single-player levels are also designed pretty well for exciting combat encounters, though whenever Mass Effect 3 attempts to go into set-piece territory, it feels either very awkward and restrictive, or just boring. The final banner on Earth is sort of in between. It's almost one of those massive battles where for the purposes of saving time and budget the game doesn't let you see any of the scale by constantly putting you in corridors and tight alleys, 
but also there are some intense sequences that elevate it beyond that, so not the worst, but Mass Effect 3 itself has more exciting battles. Which leads us to the ending. But before we talk about that, let's get back to the suicide mission from Mass Effect 2. Now, I usually don't indulge in hypotheticals. That's not analysis, and there's so many moving parts during game development that any hypothesis is not a guarantee of high quality. But I did already say before that the suicide mission concept would be a much better fit for this game. The reason is, it would allow Mass Effect 3 to have a single ending to its main plot while still maintaining the importance of player agency as it would define which characters survive. Not to mention all of the decisions of galactic repercussions from before still stand. But after a suicide mission in the middle of the trilogy, another suicide mission at the end not only would feel like a retread, but also would be insanely complex to implement. So Mass Effect 3 goes for something else to still try to focus on the aspect of agency. A final choice. And what exact choices are available depends on the multiplied by galactic readiness war asset number you've been gathering throughout the game. And I think it sort of works even in the original pre-extended cut version. Though I do find it weird that two of the choices represent the goals of the villains, Saren and the Elusive Man. Both have been painted as quite delusional, but the ending tries to put their points of view in a much more positive and beneficial light simply because it's Shepard doing them. Even Mass Effect 3 itself doesn't lay enough groundwork for those choices to feel foreshadowed. But I don't know, maybe it's because given the controversy in the past I was morally prepared for the ending, but I still felt satisfied. In fact, I think the extended cut overcompensates a bit too much, but whatever. Here's the thing. Mass Effect 3 is not a game I would have expected after Mass Effect 1. There's a lot of retcons, subtly introduced plot points, magical explanations and contrivances. Sometimes it doesn't make sense or is just plain stupid, and I get it. As I already said, the game just had to tackle so much stuff, I don't hold it against it. For one particular reason. For all its flaws, Mass Effect 3 still does showcase that your choices matter, even the one at the end, because of the connection of your choices to the characters you learn to care about, which shine here even more thanks to tons of wonderful moments of them, both dramatic and quiet. I first realized this when I started questioning if I doomed Grunt to die. I literally gasped at this scene. Shuttle's down that path. I'll hold them off. Get out of here, Shepard! Yes, there's the cutscene cinematography, the music, but one question wouldn't leave my head. Am I going to be responsible now for his death? To my great relief, thanks to the choices I've made in a totally different game, he survived. I applaud Mass Effect 3 for trying to showcase most of the consequences visually, through dialogues, be it interactive or not, cutscenes and actual gameplay moments, avoiding email resolutions as much as possible, even for such seemingly small side quests from the past, like solving a relationship conundrum between a Krogan and an Asari, which was just a single dialogue in Mass Effect 2. And while many will see the same scenes I have, no one else is going to have this Shepard and this particular journey throughout the trilogy. This is my Shepard. Shepard that at first was distrusting of all alien races out there, but in the end started fighting tooth and nail for those other races and fell in love with a Turian. Shepard that's often seen as ruthless by others. She did what no one else was ready to do on Torfan, she sacrificed hostages so terrorists wouldn't try to destroy a whole planet again, and sent half of the Alliance fleet to its death so an Asari Dreadnought could be secured, ensuring tactical advantage. But everyone who actually works with Shepard knows she never makes those choices lightly. 
She is insanely loyal to her crew, will take no bullshit, but also won't try to paint anything she does as heroic or legendary. I've been preparing it for some time. And it will be a privilege to guide the future discoverers of these records. Have you decided what you would like Dr. Tassoni to write in your entry, Commander? Put down the truth. Good? Bad? Don't leave anything out. Let history be the judge. I'll give them the facts. Let me just delete all these breathless passages on your heroics. <laughs> you writing anything I can't live up to? I can't help myself. You're a good friend, Shepard. She'll do absolutely everything in her power to avoid conflict and ensure peace. But when push comes to shove, when something has to be done right here, right now, as painful as it can be, she will not hesitate to make sacrifices so as many people as possible could keep their lives and their freedom to make their own choices. She is not a perfect shepherd, but she's a complex, three-dimensional character because these games allowed me to play her that way. Even I myself am not able to recreate this exact same shepherd I played in my first playthrough of every Mass Effect. Every new shepherd is different. And all other players will have their own shepherds. Some more idealistic, some more pragmatic, some who are ready to make different galaxy-defining choices for their own reasons. Mass Effect 3 might not be the game I wanted, but it still is going to get a Stasa Critic rating of 91 for making sure as many of my choices throughout the trilogy matter. It's a hell of a conclusion. And though it's quite messy, I do have to admit that this mess is unforgettable, beautiful, and leaves a mark right on your heart. Developed by Iron Monkey Studios, Mass Effect Infiltrator is a mobile tie-in taking place parallel to the events of Mass Effect 3. The game is still playable on modern devices, but since it's been delisted and unsupported, the connectivity to Mass Effect 3's Galaxy at War system doesn't work anymore. It should be noted that this is not an RPG at all, but more like an arcade cover shooter where you control a Cerberus operative gun rogue. There are some satisfying mechanics, for example, killing an enemy activates slow motion, during which you can perform various action chains increasing your style points. You get credits based on combat performance in each encounter, and then you can use those credits to buy or upgrade skills and weapons. While the game does present Renegade Paragon choices at key moments, there's no interactive dialogue systems, and quite honestly the plot is pretty standard and characters aren't particularly interesting. The main draw of Mass Effect Infiltrator is mobile, action gameplay that would closely resemble what you can find on consoles. And while the core shooting aspects are fun, there's a bunch of wonkiness caused by weird ways of getting out of targeting mode or turning around, inconsistencies with going in and out of cover, and the system to switch your biotics and weapons around requiring you to do a bunch of finger motions all over the screen. Trying to create interesting chains can become pretty overwhelming. I wouldn't say that the level and encounter design is varied enough to overcome these flaws, but still, Mass Effect Infiltrator gets a Stasocritic rating of 67 as a really nice game that can provide several hours of fun. But if you're not a hardcore Mass Effect fan, it might not necessarily interest you. I will be honest, based on all the feedback I've heard regarding Mass Effect 3 since 2012, I expected to hate, dislike, or at best be greatly disappointed by it. There was just no way it would be a satisfying conclusion to a journey I've started in Mass Effect 1. And I suppose, in a way, it's not. So much has changed since that first game. But I can't deny that Mass Effect 3 is still an incredibly emotionally compelling end to a long journey full of ups and downs that is going to stay with me forever. Now, the question is, if I expected to be disappointed by Mass Effect 3 but wasn't, 
Will it be the same case for Andromeda? We'll find out in the next video.